the name of our show. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi. How's it going? Happy Tuesday. Happy almost Thanksgiving. <laughs> I know. Can't believe so. we're here already. This year kind of flew by even with all the with all the slowness. It still had some fast points. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we were yeah. remarking on that, how it was supposed to be a really slow year, given yeah. the fact that we're all in isolation. And it's flown. Yeah. So, hi, Ben. Hi, Pumpkin Audrey. Good, hi, everybody. Good to see you guys. Thanks for coming. Um, yeah. so. so, so we're trying out a new show tonight. We're doing a different show tonight. So we're kind of like, Hmm, this is going to be interesting. Not our typical. There's mom. Uh, there's, there's Dave. Dave. Ben again. Hello. Good. The usual suspects are all here. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so we, we've, uh, we've been wanting to do this, this show as a variety in our format for quite a while because it's something we're passionate about. But now that we're here, we're like, this feels unfamiliar. Yeah. I'm used to having somebody to talk about or something to do. And we have a couple of people to talk about, but we're not really talking about their their history and their careers and stuff like that. We're going at it from a different standpoint. Yes. Yes, exactly. It's not the typical format where we're like, hey, here's an artist we're going to talk about tonight and we're going to teach you about that artist. This is a bit different. Mm -hmm. There's Amanda. Hi, Amanda. And Molly Whalen's here. She joined this past weekend on the drawing show okay, so great and and submitted an awesome drawing via email that i'm going to show on sunday really oh. beautiful drawing of a mushroom awesome yeah That's really I, I, cool. love I love okay. it i love it nice cool. work yeah um yeah so this format shift has given a little bit of anxiety mm -hmm. and you know that's yeah, all right. That's okay. For once, I don't have a bunch of notes. In fact, I don't have any notes tonight. <laughs> so I'm just really flying by the seat of my pants. <laughs> we have no idea what we're doing. <laughs> that's not true. We, we sort of have some idea of what we're doing. Yeah. But we've also found that our best shows, and, 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 and we're at our best a lot of the time when we're not rehearsed. Yeah, this We is talked true. about this last week. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so that's good. That's yeah. good. Um, thank you. Yeah, no, I had fun with that show on Sunday. Definitely. Um, all right. So what do we got going? First of all, we're drinking as we usually we're do on the large glass. Yeah. So, uh, we're drinking two separate things. So I've got the, well, it's winter time coming. So I've got the Sam Adams winter lager. That's what I'm going for. We don't really have a specific person that we're talking about. So usually we match the beverage to the artist but right tonight this uh, one was kind of tough to match so yeah. um but I, I have to say i thought of something you're gonna get mad at me if i say this but i'm okay, gonna say it okay, okay so so the other night terry was out and she was picking up drinks you know stuff to have around the house a couple bottles of wine some beer thing just to restock and i said pick up a couple of reds and so she came home with one that actually a house favorite that i love which is this joel got cabernet which i've got like one glass left in which i'm gonna enjoy tonight and and the uh, I'm gonna get in trouble for this. <laughs> Do you see? I'm gonna I'm gonna get in trouble. Go ahead. <laughs> I think it. I think this somehow pertains it's, to tonight. It's a good wine, and I didn't know any better. No, so, I'm not, not disagreeing. That it, not that it matters. I no, didn't. I'm not I, disagreeing, but I think this somehow pertains to tonight. Yeah, I bought it because I liked it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. I went with my gut. I took a look at it. Anyway, I liked it. Can I tell him what it is? Sure. It's and called, you know what? You know what? You're going to say it and people are like, I know that wine. I love that wine. So go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Sometimes I have opinions and that's okay. So it's called Dreaming Tree Cabernet. And it's got a cool label and it's like, oh, what a nice name. Dreaming Tree. It kind of reminds me of something between Shel Silverstein and Shel Silverstein. Anyway, um... <laughs> I don't know if you guys know who owns Dreaming Tree or how, or like, whose company it is, but I, 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 it's it's an okay wine. It's an okay wine. But anyway, when I said to Terry, I said, "You know who owns this wine, right?" And she's like, "No." And who did you say you thought it was at first? I thought maybe David Byrne. David Byrne. She thought it was David Byrne's wine. I said, "No, it's a different famous Dave. It's Dave Matthews." So Dave Matthews owns Dreaming Tree wine, which. 
I'm not trying to upset anybody out there, but it's not my favorite. Five Pieces, all right. Yeah, it's not yeah. my favorite band in the world. And then the yeah. wine was also not my favorite wine in the world. But it's just kind of funny because here's the, we can get into this trap when we buy art where it's like, um, if we don't do our homework and we don't quite know what we're buying. But you can also buy what you like. You can, and you should buy what and you, you can like. You should buy what Which you like. Which is why Terry brought home that bottle of yes. wine. And I was going to drink it tonight and tell the story, but instead I'm just going to drink the Joel Gott, tell the story, get in trouble anyway. There you go. <laughs> and I'll hear about it after the show. So if you guys are, um, if you become a tier three subscriber, you can tune into our IRL channel where the cameras are just all over the house and you can see me get yelled at. <laughs> <laughs> we don't really have that. No. Um, so um, anyway. Pump, uh, pumpkin, pumpkin Audrey, Audrey says, so. what are the beverages? Yeah, so we were in that. Um, you're having the winter lager. I am having this Cabernet. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm liking it. It's had a chance to be open and breathing. Mom's like, wow. Mom's like, yeah, do that. Do that IRL channel. Mm -hmm. Do that. IRL stands for in real life, for those of you that don't know. Don't there I go, that. being being a boomer. Um, all right, so, uh, so cheers. Cheers. Ooh. That was nice. This is a good cab. It's dirty. Ooh. Yeah, it's got like some earth in it. Yeah. It's like really earthy. All nice, right. dirty Cabernet. Nice. I love it. All right. You don't so. really hear that when people describe wine. Ooh, this is really dirty. So. I won't get into the whole thing about Gary Vaynerchuk. Okay. But one day I maybe I will. I don't even know who that is. Yeah, he's okay. like a wine guy who's from New Jersey and talks about wine in terms of how it might taste like something totally... You know, layperson. He, okay. he really brought wine to people in some ways. Hmm. So, um, but he's more, he's a real business guy. Okay. So you might not like him. Anyway, um, so should we talk about Glenn real quick? Because we always, we always yeah, plug we'll Glenn. Talk, we'll talk about Glenn. Cause okay. Because you can win a piece of his fantastic artwork. That's right. So he donated it to our show. Right. So we've got Glenn um, Lavertu as our subscriber goal. If we get to 10 subscribers, we're going to be giving away a piece of Glenn Lavertu's art. He's a friend of mine. He donated this piece to the show to help us try and get to 10 subscribers. It is a cast uh, polyurethane uh, piece that was part of a larger sculpture he was making and decided to pull an addition from the mold he made. Um, he was recently featured in Art New England magazine. I have a couple of the uh, article pages here where he was featured as one of the 10 emerging artists in the New England area. Uh, he has a long career of uh, both writing, research, and making, and is just fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is the piece, actually. Uh, it's called Angel of Death Flintlock Mechanism 2020. It's um, This is the black edition. There are black editions and white editions. We have one of the whites, which is signed mm -hmm. uh, and ready to ship. It's a beautiful little piece. And um, we, we cannot wait to bring that to you. But that's for a 10-person subscriber. Yep, and we're almost there. We only we have, have three, three to go. go. Three Lucky to go. Three. And thank you to all of you who are subscribing right now. We really appreciate that. We think that's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and once we get to 10, we're going to offload this sucker and hopefully have something new that we can plug until we get to 20. So yeah. we'll just keep going. We'll just keep going. All right. So what do we got? Let's see. Where to next? Um, you want to talk a little bit about why we do this? Why we collect? Uh, well, we're both, we love art. So we love art. It's part of who we are. I mean, we met in an art gallery. That's the first time I saw you. This is true. This is true. I was a 19 year old kid. I wasn't that much older. <laughs> and he, he wasn't that much older. And I was all the way across the room with my mom and dad. You're going to tell them about the suit. And then this guy walks in with these electric blue eyes mm -mm -mm -mm. and he Get was wearing a suit that really brought out the blue in his eyes, but the suit was coated in silicone. And I was like, who is this guy? First and of all, that was the hottest damn suit you could ever put on in your entire life. Yeah. It was horrible to wear. So, but that brings us to why we love art and why we, that's, that's who we are. And I think everybody, it's, it's for everybody. Yeah. And I think one of the things that I was always drawn to at a younger age, and by younger, I don't mean as a child, but as I started sort of getting out of my little isolated world in high school, moved out into college, started going to school for 
fine arts. Mm -hmm. And I got to see how some of the people that influenced me, my, my, my mentors, my professors, uh, and getting to go to their studios and looking at what they valued, what they decided was important in their lives and how they put it up in their house. So there was always books. There mm -hmm. was always art. There were drawers of drawings, uh, oftentimes traded with people. And it really made that life so interesting to me to be able to go through those unique objects. Mm -hmm. You know, as artists, when we're making our own work, sure, we, we're both constantly accumulating materials. We're constantly accumulating stuff we've made. Yeah. And that's one thing. But then having that other side of it where you have all this work from other people yeah. that's unique yeah. and enriching. Well, I think it even goes back further to families. Like my whole family is a family of makers. Um, I've got like painters in there. I've got um, carpenters and woodsmen and uh, potters and all of that. So I grew up with that. And I remember my parents like, I know we do need a picture <laughs> Memory of that suit. Like, I think we need a picture of that suit. <laughs> I'll, I'll, do you have a picture of that suit? Because I, I only might, saw you in it my the mom one time, might have the first picture. time I've ever seen you, you were wearing that suit. I had an absolutely fantastic sculpture professor when I was young, like one of my first years in college, and he had this art car. He had basically taken a car and turned it into a work of art that he drove to campus every day. And it was fascinating to me. So I started, started thinking about everyday objects in life that were functional and how to turn them into pieces of art and the first suit I actually made which kind of failed miserably was I took a suit coat and I coated it in this wheat paste mixture and I put grass seed in it and I watered it and some of the grass actually started to grow and I wanted to have a grass suit but number one I was promptly told that, that had already been done and I felt crushed and number two all the grass died so that didn't work so then I moved on to making this silicone suit which basically looked like I was covered in snot um and it, <laughs> it was, i don't think it, yeah. it was cool it, I mean, was it was cool it was cool but it was different man, it, was, it was very different when i took that suit off it smelled because there was so much heat and it held in all your sweat it was just gross mm -hmm. but it really looked cool yeah um, it did so uh let's see i'll have to check to see if your i have one your mom bad. will have the suit in her archives <laughs> it smelled bad yeah it did i think that's why we threw it out did it smell like silicone like or did it well, smell like sweaty at first it smelled like silicone because and, it reeked of off-gassing and chemicals and then i wore it a lot like yeah. i wore it to an opening at uh i wore it to a couple openings at rutgers i wore it to a couple of galleries mm -hmm. i remember hearing a grad student at rutgers and i was very young in my undergrad but i heard a grad student like see my suit and be like i've got an idea and i was like you take my idea, I'll eat you. Like I was mad. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that was cool. But um, so really we were was. talking about something before we came back to the suit. Um, we were talking about how we, why we collect, like why, why we're about enriching the, our our lives with about these enriching things. Enriching our lives. Yeah. 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 So that's kind of the path that we were going down. But um. <laughs> well, we, you know, I mean, let's put it this way. There's nothing normal about the house we live in. I mean, we... No, we, but that's good. Normal, normal's kind of... I don't like normal. ...boring no, to me, well, so... Well, normal's just not us. Yeah. Right? So, you know, we, we, we've we got one kid in the house who is, like, appalled at some of the collections and things that we have, and they're like, I'm never bringing another friend over she's here. She's a teenager. <laughs> she's a teenager. And so she's uh, not happy about that. But also, uh, you know, we, we pride ourselves on having great conversational objects mm -hmm. um like it could yeah. be a ball of string it does not have to be you know a work by some well-known blue chip artist no it could be actually if it's people we know it even makes it that much better more of a bond absolutely yeah absolutely yeah, i agree yep i love pumpkin audrey saying she always says this normal is a setting on the dryer that is so true that Cheers. is correct <laughs> As a matter of fact, I went down to our dryer and I just wrote the letters A, B next to normal, which says now it's abnormal. Abnormal. Gotcha. All right. So why we collect? We collect for a variety of reasons. One, we like to support our friends, mm -hmm. right? And so buying their work or trading with them is even a form of support because as that work gets disseminated mm -hmm. into a variety of collections, other people see it. Right, And so if one of my pieces of work is in someone else's collection, that's an opportunity for me to be seen. It doesn't mean I'm gonna go giving my work away, but it's an opportunity. So uh, 
as a matter of fact, the person we talked about earlier, Glenn Lavertu. Glenn used to be the studio assistant for Saul LeWitt. Now, if you don't know who Saul LeWitt is, you can go look him up. He's basically the granddaddy of, well, he's, he's the granddad of conceptual art mm -hmm. and was, you know, I mean, his work is in every major museum in the, in the whole world. And, you know, he was, he's like basically walking into a superstar studio and Glenn was his assistant. And I used to go to that compound and hang out with them and get to see his collection of art, which is one of the things that inspired me to collect. I actually, you know, had an Eva Hess piece of sculpture in my hands, which was like, and and I'm, I'm going to put this, no, I'm not going to put this out there. You can direct message me for some really damning information about that. But um, yes, I held in my hands an Eva Hess. I read some of Eva Hess's letters to Solowit, like the physical real ones, not out of a book. But I got to see this beautiful collection of work. And so what did I do when it was Solowit's birthday? I sent him a piece of my work, something I had been working on in graduate school because I really admired him and his collection. And I said, happy birthday, Saul. I hope you like this. And you want to know what? It wound up in the Solowit collection. Well, did it wind up there legitimately? I don't know, but that's okay. Yeah. Um, so Am's here. Hi, Am. Hello. Double da damn, double damn. damn. <laughs> <laughs> Will do. <laughs> wow, no way. Yeah, no, this is like this, but these are some of the things that, you know, mm -hmm. We used to do, yeah. Um, you know, and now he's gone. But anyway, I, I can get into a whole thing about Solowit, and we can talk about him. And I hope to have Glenn on sometime so he can talk about Solowit because yeah, I'm sure he's he's, got the he's really got the stories. I mean, yeah. my my connection to that guy is minimal compared to his. Yeah. So um, so anyway, that was one of the things that inspired me to not only get my work out there, and it's a mm -hmm. form of it, it's a form of trading is a form of collecting. Yes. I can so. See that. So, so that's that's one reason is supporting our friends, mm -hmm. enriching our lives. I mean, those are two of the big ones. Mm -hmm. And I think as we do this, we're going to do this collecting show maybe once a month, maybe once every two months, and we'll talk about more reasons to collect as well. Like you know, collecting can be an investment, mm -hmm. right? But we're not going to make that the first show, right? Because I, I think it's about something bigger. Yeah, it's more of just kind of exposing, you know, how to collect kind of thing, or why why we started rather i i feel i've even told you i feel silly saying why you should collect i could say why i love to collect and what i think the benefits of collecting art are so that's more of the angle i look at it right. from right 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 well we right. do you know and so i think what terry's trying to say is she doesn't want me to say things like you should go buy this person you should go buy this person's art because this person is going to be it's going to be enriching for you. It's going to go up in value because I'm not like that's that's not why I'm in this. Well, the person that you have tonight, though, just from a collecting standpoint, you actually should go buy that guy's work. Oh, but, um, so she just told me not to do that, this. That, but that's not but I didn't want to come at it like as an authoritarian. Oh, you should do this and you should. You know what I mean? Like we're we're talking about it from a different angle. So <laughs> anyway, well, we will talk about how some of these things have changed in value if yeah. it's relevant. I yeah. mean, I think that's part of the conversation. I think so. Um, you know, we're all here to kind of talk about collecting tonight. So mm -hmm. let's we can make that part of it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So um, one of the other reasons we're doing this show this week, starting out this week, is we've got the single worst day in the calendar year approaching. Holiday wise. It, I'm, it's not a holiday. But it is because I like workplaces have off that day and it kind of is a holiday. And you know, it bothers me that this damn day gets placed directly next to the only holiday we have where you don't have to go out and buy a bunch of shit. I know. It's like, okay, you want to know what? You guys got your day off. Mm -hmm. You got to eat your, your dinner. You got to spend time and give thanks. And now that you've spent the day not buying anything, get out there and buy a bunch of crap. And it's Black Friday. And so what are we gonna do on Black Friday this year? Most of us are gonna be ordering stuff on Amazon or ordering stuff from things online. And this is a perfect opportunity for you to get out there this week and either skip Black Friday or take a chunk of that money that you're gonna to use to give gifts with and support an artist. Yeah. And we're gonna show you a couple of ways that you can look those artists up and buy well, from them. I think getting away from this mass produced culture of plastics and stuff like that, something handmade um, 
they made from an artist just means so much more because you can see somebody spending time with that piece and creating it and it gets translated to you that way too like you form an emotional connection with it and there's just so many enriching factors about it you are supporting an artist you're helping them to continue their art you're purchasing something to beautify your home that doesn't look like everything else in a, a store and don't get me wrong i love some of those stores like target and stuff like that but in terms of art it's one of a kind it's unique yeah somebody else doesn't have it um, it could be really meaningful for somebody. It can increase in value in in years to come. How, how many times have you gone to some holiday gathering where there's gift giving going on and someone gives you something and then you go to another gathering and someone gives you the same thing? Yeah. It's because these things are not only ubiquitous, but they're they're just kind of, you know, the top 10 gifts to give this year. All right, yeah. well, let me buy all of those and just give them out. And you're going to wind up getting three of them. Those become the white elephant gifts for next year. And then you want to know what? Half the time when I'm coming home from some of these events, I want to stop at the thrift store and drop half the stuff off I got at the thrift store because I'm just overwhelmed with things. So why not make those things, A, have some kind of genuine uniqueness to them? There is no way two people are going to give me the same piece of art that were bought from my my art contacts. There's just no way that's going to happen, right? And I'm not trying to sound entitled. I'm not trying to sound like it's like, oh, I don't want gifts because you're going to give me the same thing. I'm just trying to really talk about adding some value into what it is you're doing out there. Mm -hmm. Mom says, not me, buying local and artists. Yeah. Good for you, Mom. That's and, good. And something unique and handmade. Um, it can become an heirloom quality. That's, you know, it's something to pass down to your next generation. That's important. Like that. So even if... You know, some people look at it in terms of investing, but buying what you like and adding to your life and having it be part of something that you leave to future generations um, is really valuable. Yeah. Oh, artwork, elegant exchange. Did We've done a couple of those. Memory Vessel, I know, has been involved in some of these. I remember in college, we were having gallery openings in our attic. And I know that we've had these kind of like exchange programs where, and this is a great way to trade, right? Where if you know other artists, you can make an addition to piece and every person in that group all makes the same numbered addition, which is the same number of people in the group. And then everyone gets one of those. So if, I used to do this with certain classes that I taught. So if we had 18 people in the class, everybody would make an addition of 19. Oh, elephants. That, okay. Artwork elephant exchange. Oh, 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 yes. 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 That sounds like a fun idea. That could be good. Yeah. That could be good. As a matter of fact, I have something. Oh, I'm going to put this on next week's show. Okay. I can't remember what the name of it is, but I've got I've got something awesome to talk about next week. And it's in that, it's kind of on that white elephant uh, uh, idea. So anyway. 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 Why don't we talk about how we first got into art collecting? You can start this off if you want to. I want to hear what you have to say about, like, what first drove you to do this? Like, what... What opened you up to collecting art? When was the first time you saw it? Uh. <laughs> I'm prompting you. Well, Todd, <laughs> um, <laughs> when I actually, it was accidental and it was like a weekend thing, you know, as a little kid with my parents. And um, I think there was like a sidewalk art show. Yeah. And I come from a family of people who are very interested in the arts. My dad's been painting forever. Brilliant painter. Um, but he did it for fun. Like he did it as he just liked to get in. He loved the feeling of painting and escaping and all of that. Mm -hmm. So we had been in a sidewalk show and we came across a local artist who had a booth. Um, and they were very busy <laughs> illustrative paintings in oil really nice it's um it's an artist from philadelphia um illustration is about the the way i would describe his pictures mm -hmm. they're very cutesy um but i was a little kid and i i liked stuff like that plus that was my first exposure to i think a real artist who was out on the street selling his paintings mm -hmm. and he had oil paintings but he also had copies of his prints um, I remember he had a book that was about his life as a kid and it was all illustrations and such like that and my parents really liked his work back then it was the 80s and 
they were interested in buying a painting and I was like oh and I was looking at the painting it was beautiful it was this like winter scene with these two kids running and um anyway they bought it but they bought it for a lot of money I remember and I was like whoa that's the first time I saw a piece of artwork go for something you know where it, it registered in my mind like that can we it's say how of, much or you don't want to say how much um, well back then it was probably like nine hundred dollars like in a, at a street stop, at, at a street, street fair right yeah and they bought they didn't That's significant they didn't know the artist like they liked him because he was a local he's from right down the street um and they bought it because they liked it they didn't buy it because of any other reason they didn't think he was you know gonna be this famous artist or anything like that so we had it i love the story with it um and then a year or two later they bought a second painting and then they bought a third painting so they they accumulated it um his artworks but then it turned up and he's he's very cutesy i don't think my parents would um particularly like his aesthetic now but for the time i have a sentimental connection to it because sure. i remember it and this guy is right in our hometown right um but then you know franklin mint picked him up and started carrying his illustrations all over the their plates and i think hallmark had something with him oh my god and he's a little <laughs> he's a little and when i say little i mean small town artist yeah. like that's what i mean yeah um, and he blew up a little bit. So my parents' paintings went up a little bit in value too. And his name, he's a local artist. His name is Bill Bell. He's very cute. He's got lots of cats in his paintings. It's a guilty <laughs> pleasure. I love it. Um, but that was the most inspiring thing for me is because I saw the value increase. I saw this guy getting um, these commercial deals off of his artwork. And we had some of the originals. Yeah. And that was one of, the things that inspired the art collecting thing um but you know they moved on from that they started getting into like eric sloan who's a well-known painter and um some other artists but that was i think what's important about that story though is that you know number one you saw your parents i mean and, and i hate to dwell on the money on this but there is something about this there is they bought something for a va for an amount of money that you would never see them buy no right? they, they wouldn't spend that kind of money no, on my things. dad worked for the post office and my mom was a secretary at the time and they didn't have a lot of money they had two kids they were they'll tell you they were trying to find you know coins in the couch cushions and stuff like that but they they dropped some money on this painting right and so to see somebody put that much value to bring that into their home, to, to place that much value on a thing mm -hmm. and allow that to be an acceptable purchase in their life. That shows that that's important to them. Mm -hmm. And they really loved that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's really important too about what we're trying to say when we say buy what you love. Uh, we're gonna get into a couple of other rules for buying art um, that are gonna be about, you know, sort of educating yourself and knowing where to buy. But um, when you buy what you love, it doesn't matter whether or not that guy, that woman, that person, that entity, that collaboration is represented in the MoMA or in Gallery X in New York. That's the hot gallery with the hot curator. That does not matter, okay? What matters is, is that you like it and that's the first thing that brings it to you. And if you're educated about what it is, why you like it, who made it, and, 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 and the whole context within which it was developed and you understand that, and that resonates with you, you're on, you're off the races. That's the first step. I really, I really think that. So it doesn't matter. Yeah, no, it doesn't. And I, I still look at his work and I still love it because I remember those, those stories. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I love the painting that Terry bought on that, on that artist, artist tour. tour we went on. That was uh, Bill that Jersey. Was Yes, there was some Bill Jersey, but then we also went to that other studio and I bought that cow painting. Oh, yeah, yeah, too. yeah. That yeah. was beautiful. So, so either or. They're, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Pumpkin Audrey's. I love Helen, our bat. Yeah, um, Helen is a freeze dried bat. Freeze dried bat. <laughs> a taxidermy. Has. Taxidermy She's... bat. So um, let's let's um, let's keep this going because we're like we're already halfway through our show. And we're just kind of like, yeah, we're okay. already 30 already. All right. Okay. We're going to we'll right. run late. People don't care if we run late. Yeah, they don't care. All right. Okay. So, um, so actually, we have a list. Well, can uh, I tell my story about how I first got? Yes. Into? Go ahead. All right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, 
Mine's not nearly as. Well, as... I thought it was going to be about the big artist. That's why I wanted to. No, it's actually not. Oh, okay. But mine's not nearly as detailed as yours is because you have a much better memory than I do. But I think w growing up as an artist and going to school for this, I think I started collecting art before I realized I was collecting art. Um, I, I knew early on that I loved these things and I knew that I could not afford them. So one of my mentors in college, Gary Keene, who's a sculptor, uh, I used to go to his studio all the time. Um, there was a moment when a very famous uh, collector of drawings in New York tried to acquire one of his drawings. He was a bit of a curmudgeon, he blew him off, he didn't really say anything to him, and then we finally hooked the two of them up together. This guy, uh, his last name's Kramarski, he's a famous dr collector of drawings, came to Gary's studio, went through a whole bunch of drawings from the flat file, laid them out on the table, and he looked at these two, and he said, how much for these? And Gary just shrugged his shoulders because he didn't have any idea, and he was just like, 10,000. Hmm. And this guy was like, fine, boom, wrote the check and took them with him right there. And I was just like, I will never be able to buy a drawing as long as I live, right? So what I started doing was trading for these things. I started making work and asking my friends who were artists if we could trade. And before you knew it, I had to go buy a flat file because I had so much stuff wow. in tubs and things like that. And do those people go on to become famous? No, sometimes, but no. But I love those works, yeah. right? And I feel like I know that that work, the freaking flat file, tell me about it. Yeah, right? The heaviest, sharpest pain in the ass every artist has to deal with that number one takes up way too much room it's like well how can we make a table out of the flat file this week when you got to move nobody wants to move the flat file right but it's necessary so um you know i feel like when i acquired this piece of work i in, in turn gave a piece of work and mm -hmm. i and I, now there's an exchange that's a little bit more meaningful yeah. than i just threw some cash mm -hmm. and got this thing mm -hmm. right so there's something there's kind of a story that goes by it Owning one was on my list of four things that constitute my definition of success. So check. Yeah. Nice. Off the bucket list with that one. Yeah, Amanda. I think they're so nice. I think they're so nice. Yeah, yeah I absolutely. Agree. I agree. I love it when you open it. It's like a treasure chest. It's like, because not only are they just like singular drawings and paintings and whatever, there's multiple things in there from handwritten letters to Little gorgeous. sewn tapestries. Yeah, like yeah. beautiful, beautiful pieces. I got all kinds of stuff in you there. You do, yeah. So, and they come in a bunch of shapes and sizes. The more flat files, the better from my crater. Yeah, I know. No, I know. And you know, there is this sort of, and, and one of you out there can tell me what this size is because I don't have this one, but basically the standard gallery flat file, which to me I think is somewhere around four feet across the front. Uh, it's usually one unit is four drawers high, and then you stack those units. And then of course it's got the depth to it. Um, they're fairly large, and it's always been my dream to find one of those like on the street, which you don't, you know, when you find these things now dented and crappy, they're hundreds of dollars still. Mm -hmm. And to buy one new, forget about it. Wow. The one I have is much, it's not much smaller, but you can't quite get a four by eight or a, um, 18 by 24 in it. So the, the drawers themselves are only about 22 wide mm. and they're about 38. No, um, sorry. They're about, I don't, they're about squarish actually. But there's 25 drawers in this thing, all the way up. It's all metal. It's an antique. I mean, it's very, very old. And it weighs, I don't know, more than my car. It's the heaviest damn thing I've ever encountered. But I saw it sitting out of this guy's, outside of this guy's studio once, and I was like, I have to have that. And he's like, well, it's for sale. And I thought, you know, I was in Providence, Rhode Island at the time in a little town called Pawtucket, uh, which is north of Providence. That's where my studio was. I thought I was in the middle of nowhere. And so I said to the guy, I'm like, how much you want for that? And he's like, uh, give me 500. And I was like, I don't have $500. I'm a graduate student. And he's like, well, let me think about it. So then he came back to me and he gave it to me for 250, which was a steal. But I still have it and it's packed. It is packed. It's packed. Yeah. So anyway, I didn't really realize I was collecting until I got a collection accumulated. Mm -hmm. And I started finding value in all of these things. But the first, can I go... I actually have here at Teenies the first painting I ever bought in a gallery from an artist. Can okay. I grab it? Yeah, you can grab it. You talk. I'll be back. No pressure. <laughs> you 
He's very excited about this. Oh, it's gonna take him two seconds. He's got it, he's coming back. I'm like, you talk. Yeah, I didn't realize it was right there though. So, first of all, um, well, let me show the painting. So, this is an artist we'll probably do on the show one night, but his name is Josh Dorman. And he shows in New York. Uh, he shows all over, actually. Let's see if we can get this sucker to focus. There it is. It is this very, very sweet little abstracted landscape painted on a wooden panel, right? It is signed on the back, Josh Dorman. I think that says, does that say 87? 97. 97. A very good year. I think this was the first piece I ever bought actually in a gallery. He actually, he wrote my name on the back for Todd. Uh, but Josh Dorman is like, you know, he's got some good paintings out there. I bought this for a hundred bucks. This is an oil painting. A hundred bucks. Here, hide so this focus is ready. There it is. I love that. It has a lot of texture to it, too. And, the and, mountain ridge and... Yeah, and the thing I wanted to say is memory vessel, if you're still watching, this painting hangs right above one of your husband's paintings. So there's these little, this collection of tiny little paintings on a piece of trim in the house. And so this is there. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I felt so good buying this because, you know, I really felt like I was, A, supporting someone. Yeah. And B, like, I, you know, it, 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 I sort of made that investment, mm -hmm. right? I committed now to really doing this on a different level. It felt mm -hmm. so good. I love this painting. Mm -hmm. It's really dear to me. Um, it's a rite of passage, exactly. Exactly. Yep. Um, so anyway, support your fellow artists. Mm -hmm. Give up on Black Friday a little bit. Get out there and buy some stuff. I think every single person in this room has probably something they can offer on that artistic level because I know every single one of you. And well, not every single one of you. There's some people in here that are watching that I still haven't seen maybe follow, but that's cool. Um, yeah, we gave art favors. Yes, you did, and that was one of them, and 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 I still love that. That's one of my one of my favorites. Um, so, so that's my story. Is I wasn't really an art collector. All of a sudden, the stuff was just there, and it was mm -hmm. just because I had this commitment of sharing. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how it happened. So, um, what do you want to talk about next? Well. Um, oh, we, our list? Yeah, we made this list. Go ahead. I really thought that guy was going to be your story. That's why I was like, we're just going to move on because we have some um, some images coming up. Um, yeah, we got stuff to show you. We do. Uh, but we were looking around and doing a little bit of research. Not that I don't feel like we need to do research on this because we do what we like. And that's number one. You buy what you like. If Well, you mean research for there. the show. Yeah. But well, we do research when we're buying. Yeah. Yeah, well, yes, we yeah. do. Yeah. We do. And actually, that's one of um, the tips. So we were looking online. There's some tips out there, all kinds of websites, how to collect, what you should do. And we were kind of like taking a little bit from each one. And these were some of the top things. You buy what you like. You educate yourself, like you were saying. Mm -hmm. You find out about the artist, the mm -hmm. context, all of that. Um, you start small and you grow. Yes. Yes, you can buy, and we're going to show you this tonight. You can buy work for 50 bucks. And I'm talking about nice stuff, like stuff that's really, you know, wor well worth that investment. Yeah. And that's a small investment, right? You don't have to go out and spend $5,000 on a piece of artwork. Mm -hmm. uh, knowing where to look, which is a little bit challenging given the pandemic right now, but we're going to tackle that too. Um, have a budget, which is my thing. I'm all about budgets <laughs> i'm all about breaking budgets yes <laughs> and mm, um not i not that one um and how to buy so yeah we're going to talk about that one because too buying but... buying can be tricky buying can be tricky but what about the lists that we made do you remember when we did so we were playing a game we played a game and we were thinking about our top five places our top five favorite places to buy work or favorite scenarios within which we can buy work okay from bottom to top okay so and then we didn't show each other the list that's true so you want to you want to do your number five and i'll do my number I five i can do my number five okay my number five is antique stores ah that's a good one i love antique stores especially when you look at some of the stuff hanging on the wall and some of it does have some yeah value and if you begin to educate yourself on some of this stuff there is that possibility that you'll be like that guy i work with one of these people mm -hmm. who wanders into an antique store and finds you know like a drawing by peter paul rubens 
and the antique store doesn't realize what it's got mm -hmm. and you get it for a hundred bucks and I know somebody that happened to mm -hmm. and I kind of just wanted to kill myself but good for him yeah <laughs> all right my number five is Instagram I love Instagram especially now because I think Instagram is a place where you can go and you're not always going to be able to buy work on Instagram you're going to come across artists on Instagram that you can't buy from because mm -hmm. they're represented by a gallery already but mm -hmm. there's plenty of artists on there that you can buy but from. even if you can't buy from them they say who they're represented by and you can go through the gallery absolutely and then buy through the gallery so i think instagram has lots of little pathways to find i mean you're seeing exactly what you want and then you can just follow that lead yeah and yeah get it. totally yeah what's your number four my number four was instagram oh <laughs> Check. Sorry. We covered that one. That's good. Yeah. Uh, my number four is studio tours. Is yours on there too? That was my number three. Damn it. <laughs> See, we're exactly alike. But, you know, studio tours are great places to meet artists. You can talk to them right there in their studio um, and, and really have an opportunity to connect, which is nice. It is. Um, that's what we did for Black Friday a couple of years ago. Our town does that. Well, not our town, but the county, yeah. New Jersey, does that covered, covered bridge. bridge thing. Yeah, that's a great one. We saw multiple art studios, and we bought quite a bit that year. Remember, we were buying paintings and yeah, yeah, some really cool stuff. And but... then, and then the then the bills came. Then the bills came. <laughs> but that's okay. But that's okay, and it's still hanging on our wall. And then we remember the day, and we remember hanging out day. with your mom, and yeah, yeah that was yeah. that was a great day. All right, so that was your number three, and that my was my number, number three. four. My number three. My number three is trading, which I already covered also. Hmm. Trading with people. I feel like trading is, you know, a great way to go. Not all, not everybody's always going to want to trade with you, mm -hmm. but you know, sometimes it works. Yeah. So, all right, what's your? Um, my number two was the nearby art schools and colleges. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Because they because have- Because that's emerging to me. Yeah. Um, especially if you, you see their work for the first time and they're just getting their feet wet and there's the excitement going on there because sometimes it's their first sale, yeah. which is also really exciting to be part of. Yeah. Um, and you get to see how the whole thing operates. They're all putting it together in terms of showing in the gallery. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen some people actually go far, like, uh, from, like I can think of a couple artists that we started with that yeah, started in absolutely. a smaller gallery and became absolutely. something and then yep. just seeing them back then, yep. you know. There was an artist at the community college near us named Daryl Del Vecchio. Yeah, and I'm also thinking of Paul Henry. Ramirez. Yes. Yes, Paul Henry Ramirez. Yeah. Yeah, both of those guys. And we saw them when they were just starting out and now they're pretty successful. Well, yeah, that guy, Daryl Del Vecchio, who made these really beautiful tonal abstract collages mm -hmm. on canvas, which were gorgeous. He had donated one to an art auction mm -hmm. and I had bought a ticket to that auction and I actually scored his painting and he was a student at the college. Yeah. But he broke a major, major rule or didn't break a rule, but he did something that's kind of like laughed at a little bit. He basically took a lot of pictures of his work, made them into slides, made a sheet of slides and walked around galleries in New York to basically say, hi, I'm an artist. Will you carry my work? Mm -hmm. And that's just not the yeah, way that's not, you that works. That. That's yeah. not the way that works. And so we thought, Ugh. yeah, but the crazy thing is he got picked up and his, he got a solo show and he sold out yep. and Alvin Ailey, bought four of his paintings and rapidly collected them. And all of a sudden I've got one of those. And I yeah. was like, yes, wow. that's yeah. a great thing. That's why it's exciting to go to the, the colleges around you um, and see what they have in store. It's a little challenging right now because of the pandemic. But right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Mom says, I always bought at the RVCC art show. That was a good art show. It mm -hmm. still is a good art show. Mm -hmm. um, okay. My number two is an app that I have on my phone. And I think it's awesome. And it's called Artsy, A-R-T-S-Y. So it's basically like a, uh, um, it kind of collects all of the, it aggregates all of these auctions, gallery sales. Uh, you can follow artists on Artsy. 
almost anyone who's ever had a show in any kind of reputable space is on that. Um, so you can follow them and whenever a piece of their work becomes available, you can either buy it outright, mm -hmm. you can bid on it. They usually come with condition reports. They're fairly well, uh, they're very reputable. They carry reputable sources. So a lot of the artists that I collect right now are available through that site. Mm -hmm. I don't always buy through it. Mm -hmm. And one thing you have to remember and you really have to research is a lot of those auctions come with buyer's premiums. Those buyer's premiums can be as high as 25%. Mm. So there's been work on there before that I've seen, and I'll see a piece that's like, I haven't been in the market for this for a while, but there'll be like a piece on there that's $1,200. And I'm like, oh, mm. you know, that's totally worth $1,200. And then I'm like, yeah, but there's going to be another 300 on top of that that's a buyer's premium. Right. That, you know, that changes the game a little bit. But Artsy is a fantastic app. And even if you just want to start to follow people and browse and look at what their art sells for, Mm -hmm. It's it's a great thing. Yeah, actually, a couple of the artists that we featured on our show um, are available through Artsy. That's why I was pulling up some of the, the comps and stuff like that to look at. Where you were looking at the values. Yeah. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. For sure. What's your number one? My number one. My number one, friends and family. Yeah. Because, which I guess is like you with trading. Yeah. Um, but I feel like we have so many art artistic friends and family members that I I like to go through them sometimes mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, my number one is directly from friends. <laughs> oh, directly see? from friends. Upside down. So we're we're both on the same page we're on that. On the now same that's page. that can be difficult sometimes, especially when those friends are represented by galleries. So the way that works is typically when an artist signs on with a gallery, uh, they'll sign a contract that basically says they are not allowed to sell their work to anyone. If, unless it is done through the gallery or with the gallery's permission, uh, because they basically now control the economy around which that work is going to be valued at. So let's say that gallery is selling my paintings for $5,000 a piece, and I go ahead and offload one to a friend of mine for 500 bucks. That's going to, and, and then that person goes and sells it mm -hmm. for a thousand. Well, that radically shifts the dynamics, uh, the, the economic dynamics around how those works are valued. And so, do I like that system? No. Um, do I think that should be invaded and changed? Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. That's something I think that really kind of messes with things a little bit. Yeah. Um, it is what it is for now, but that's gonna be a stumbling block I think some of you might run into if you try to go that route. But it is definitely worth reaching out to the individual artists themselves and saying, hey, you know, I'm interested in your work. Could I could I buy a piece from you directly? Mm -hmm. See what they say. Yeah. All right. So let's kind of talk about. Um, we covered all of this. Well, we kind of did, but we kind of didn't. Yeah, but um, we're like we're at ten minutes. I to know. Nine. We're really going. We should talk this. about some artists. I just we want. Can, can I talk about the print thing real quick? Mm, you can absolutely talk about the. Actually, we can go ahead and talk about the artists if you want. Well, we should talk about prints too, because okay. prints I think are a really big part of. You mean that famous artist, Audrey Schmidt, and her blue tarp? Yeah, we're going to leave that one alone, Dave. Thank you. Dave's trying to tap into my momentary lapses of sanity. We'll tell that story another time. Maybe we'll even show that piece. But let's talk about prints for a minute because mm. prints are a really fantastic way to start your collection. They are, number one, they usually they come in a run, meaning there's an addition, meaning there's a limited number of them to one degree or another almost always. Sometimes there is an open edition, which means there are unlimited prints. Mm -hmm. But what this does is it makes art accessible. It takes an image and it reproduces it through, there's many, many, many varieties of printmaking. And so knowing what they are and knowing uh, how they're actually sort of performed can sort of help you decide what's valuable to you and what's not. But what it ultimately does is it makes art accessible. It brings the price way down. You are no longer paying hundreds or thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars for an individual painting. You now can pick something up for an addition price, which can range from a couple of bucks to a couple hundred dollars and mm -hmm. possibly in the thousands if you're, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know, for, for example, Donald Judd, who's one of my favorite sculptors, um, you cannot buy one of his sculptures. Uh, and if, if one ever did come up for auction, I would probably need somewhere in the vicinity of eight figures to get it. We're talking tens of millions of dollars to wow. acquire a piece of his, right? A drawing would be tens of thousands of dollars, if not more, mm -hmm. right? But you can buy a Donald Judd print 
for 3500 bucks. Now that's not, still a lot of money. I'm not saying that's pocket change to me, but given that the works that he has out there in the world, he has passed away, his work is very famous, that's an accessible number for somebody who really wants to put like a crown jewel in their collection, mm. right? So prints are accessibility. Now, what prints, what, st- what, what methods of printmaking are, are what? Um, and I'm not going to go into all of those tonight. I can't. We're going to talk about one in particular. Actually, we're going to talk about two. Okay, we're going to talk about serographs, also known as silkscreen prints. And we're going to talk about gicle prints, also known as pigment prints, like archival inkjet. Basically meaning they come out of a computer printer. But I don't want to cheapen that too much. I don't want to, like, talk that down. I have some of those in my collection, and I think they're fine in most cases. So what's the difference between these two? In the case of a silkscreen print, you have a screen with an image that has been projected onto that and basically developed like a photograph that a squeegee is pulled over, a color of ink is laid down on a piece of paper, and through multiple passes of different colors, you develop an image. This is done by hand. It's often done by a master printer, and it has the hand involved in its actual making, which is, I think, really important. Uh, you can buy silk screen prints for $25, $35, $100 um, by very well-known artists. And we're going to look at one of those tonight as a very, very collect- collectible option for you. The Gicle print, on the other hand, is a much cheaper means of production. It is much more accessible by artists. So you could go out as an artist right now. You could buy a archival pigment jet printer, basically meaning it's like your Epson printer. But rather than printing with dye-based inks, which fade in sunlight, these print with pigment-based inks, which do not fade. They're much more expensive, the inks I mean, but um, ultimately it is a computer printout. Does that cheapen it a little bit? Yes, yes. The means of production is faster, it's quicker, and I feel like it does not necessarily have the hand as directly involved. And, And there's basically a gradation of how much hand was in the process of making this print. So the Gicle, you can pick up Gicle prints for 10 bucks. You can pick them up for 40 and I have seen on occasions ones that go for hundreds and into the thousands, which kind of makes me scratch my head a little bit, but fair enough. Hmm. Um, but they are very accessible. So those are two types of prints. We will talk about these more. The serograph, also known as the silkscreen print, and the Gicle print, spelled G-I-C-L-E-E, uh, also known as the inkjet print. So you decide what's valuable to you. Would Gicleg prints be a great way for you to start a collection? Totally. Absolutely. I think you should buy them, right? But then think about growing and moving up that ladder. All right. So should we talk about an artist? We can talk about an artist. All right. We're going to start you guys off with a very easy artist to collect, but it's also at the same time he's, not an easy artist to collect. Yeah, he's not easy. He's a lot of fun. He's serious. He's political. He's political. And I think most of you probably could have, you're probably just like, yeah, of course. So we're going to talk a little bit about Shepard Ferry briefly. I don't want to go too deep into his history, Mm -hmm. but Shepard Ferry, a.k.a. Obey, Mm -hmm. um, is a... Graffiti artist. Graphic designer. Yeah. Graffiti artist. Mm -hmm. Um, And he has really developed a name for himself as probably the single most prolific street artist in the world well we're all about accessibility and he makes his artwork very accessible sort of if Mm. you can get it (laughs) well and getting it is not about money getting it is about timing yes timing is crucial Mm -hmm. so in a nutshell Shepard Ferry starts out at RISD the Rhode Island School of Design a roommate of his comes home one day and asks him if he knows anything about making a stencil he does, and so with some um, some acetate and a newspaper clipping of the professional wrestler Andre the Giant, Shepard Ferry makes a stencil of Andre the Giant and shows him how to do this for a school project. Um, Andre, yeah, exactly. Mom says, love him, can never snag one of his. Well, we might be able to help you out a little bit with that. So Andre the Giant, he, 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 all of a sudden, Shepard Ferry recognizes the sort of, uh, the sort of prolific potential for an image through the use of a stencil. And he begins plastering this image of Andre the Giant in a number of formats all over Providence. 
He gets into stickers. He actually takes personal ads out in newspapers all over the world and basically says, hey, send me a dollar. I'll send you an envelope of stickers. And he does. And people start putting his stickers up all over. And before you know it, the image of Andre the Giant has a posse with his statistics on it becomes one of the single most shared images in an analog fashion on Earth. This image has been repeated so many times, it actually attracted the um, Andre the Giant estate to sue him. Mm -hmm. Mike, thank you for coming. It's good to see you, buddy. We appreciate you coming. Um, so he gets sued and he's got to change his entire thing to um, what essentially amounts to obey, right? So he loves this idea that imagery in repetition can change the world, can have an impact on how people think. And he loves this idea of propaganda and how the image is something you obey. And so obey becomes the name now with a much more abstracted image of Andre the Giant's face as a throwback, a usable throwback to what he's doing. So what does he do? He starts tapping into other means of printmaking production. He moves very much into the serigraph silkscreen world and creates these fantastic propaganda-like posters that are fantastically, and I'm gonna keep using that word because I just think this is awesome. These are super available. These come up on his website approximately weekly. Um, and when I first started collecting him back in 2002, yeah, 2002, these were $30. And they usually editioned around, there were usually 200 in the edition. So they'd be hand signed and they'd be numbered X out of 200, um, 30 bucks. And so, yeah, I was still really poor. I had just gotten out of graduate school. I, I didn't really have a job, but I really loved this work, mm -hmm. right? So Shepard starts kind of playing with this more and more and more and begins, you know, changing up the imagery. He's dropping one a week. And here's the beauty of it. Back then, you could go on his website, obeygiant.com. And the last 10 weeks of posters would be available. Mm. Pick which one you want. Mm-hmm. You know, anyone you want. Sure. Nowadays, the drop hits the website, and I'm not joking, within five, and I've counted it, five seconds, the entire run is sold out. It's not 200 anymore. It's usually closer to five or 600 in the run. It's gone instantaneously. Mm -hmm. But these are fantastic images, and he loves the propaganda image. However, he does break off into other types of imagery as well. And it spans a variety of subject matters. So um, I'm just putting a few examples up here. But there's a few I want to talk about, ones that I actually have a little bit of storytelling for you on. This one I really wish I had gotten. It's a cop that says, I'm going to kick your ass and get away with it. And I loved this so much, but here's why this one was different and why I didn't get this one. His posters are almost exclusively 18 by 24. So I've got a portfolio that I keep those in and it's full. This, however, I think is three feet by four feet. Now the posters themselves, the original ones are 30 bucks a piece. This one was 400 because it's so big. And I was like, oh God, I can't get that. And so I let it go and I just love it so much. Anyway, on and on and on, more. If you go to this guy's website and go to his print archive, it goes back for almost two decades, mm. week by week by week and it is just chock full of fantastic stuff. And you can keep an eye out for him on Instagram. He posts when he's gonna drop his next piece. He gives you the links to where they're gonna drop. And if you're fast and you've got PayPal preloaded and you're like super nimble, you can get one. Yep. Now what I really like about them though, for example, when you would buy them, it would be about $35 a piece because I'm always looking at the monetary angle as well. Um, and then, what, a week later, they would be... Well, what's funny, it's the same day. So nowadays, these posters are dropping for between 50 and $75 a piece, right. which I still think is a fantastic buy. Uh -huh. And it sells out in five minutes. And if you look on eBay, honestly, as the, auction, as the site is selling out, if you look on eBay, someone's grabbed the picture of the poster right off of his website, thrown their copy that they just acquired but haven't been shipped yet, up onto eBay, and they sell for 450 Mm -hmm. instantly so you're not gonna really find them you can find them for less than that but you know 
there are apps for those types of drops where it auto inputs everything so that you can get through in those few seconds. Thank you. Yes, there are. And if you could, Amanda, if you feel so inclined, and I'm not sure if you could put a link in there, but send me that link in an email or a link or two of those because yes, I would love to get those out to everybody and I can put a link in the chat. So I'll send those links to everyone. So I have a little story about this one that's on the screen right now, the Godfather. Um, these are each, each one of these is 18 by 24. And you could buy at the time the numbered set where every number matched. So if you were gonna get, this was, first of all, this was an addition of 500. So if you were gonna get number 251 out of 500, each one of these was number 251. However, a lot of people broke those sets up and sold them. So sometimes you find these with, they're all four there, but all four numbers are different. So I saw these hit the website and I was like, oh, those are awesome. Boom, 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 boom. I put them in my cart and I didn't realize how much money I was spending. And by the time I got to the checkout and I had another poster in there, it was $150, mm. 30 bucks for each of these, mm -hmm. right? And then another 30. Hmm. I'm looking at that and I was like, I gotta pay rent. I can't buy this. So I turned off my computer and I went and made dinner and I didn't buy them. So. I'll have to ask my sneaker friend and get back to you. I've never used it. She used to. Okay, that would be cool. So um, so I didn't buy it. A month and a half later, I log on to see what he's dropped lately. And I'm looking through them. I find one I like and I put it in my cart. And when I open up my cart, this is still in there. And I was like, oh, there's no way they're still around. But it's in my cart. This is before carts had that timeout feature on them. I mean, this was back in... I think I bought these in 2003 or four, maybe five. Anyway, so I said, what the heck? Let's check out. So I checked out, I bought these for $120. They showed up two weeks later in a tube. I immediately flattened them out and put them in my case. And then I saw them on Artsy a couple of weeks ago, an exact numbered set, a match numbered set, sold for $10,000, $10,000. Mm -hmm. And I bought these because I loved them and I like this work. But $10,000 from 120 was just like, I, I kind of did a little dance. It's exciting. I was like, yeah. oh my God. Yeah. How did that happen? So Shepherd Fairy's work is very, very collectible, mm -hmm. both as something that I think is enjoyable to have around you. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that it's got this, the quality of these works is off the hook. He uses fantastic quality paper. The craftsmanship and the printmaking is exquisite. Every single one of these comes hand signed. I've actually seen pictures of him with all the prints laid out as he's signing and numbering. So he goes through every single, all 500 of them, he hand signs. And th there's a tactility to this. These mm -hmm. are beautiful. Yeah. You have somebody you want to show us. Um, kind of. It wasn't, I don't collect on the level that you collect Shepard Fairy on. I think one of the reasons why you liked him so much was that you could actually see his work out in the public. You knew he was making a difference in the environment. Um, he's very politically oriented. He's all about the causes and, and beautifying areas, even if it's not done in the most legal ways. Right. Um, but you saw it and you liked it and you've found out how you could acquire it because yeah. you loved it. Yes. Um, the artist that I was thinking about, I haven't collected him in the quantity, um, but he was also outside in the world. When I was out in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, there was an artist that really changed the landscape and you can't go anywhere in Philadelphia without seeing his work. Um, he's a bit of a madman. Um, but I remember seeing his work and wanting to bring the outside in. And his name is Isaiah Zager. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of him. He lives in South Philly. Um, he has a place called the Magic Gardens on South Street. And he's actually responsible for some of the Philadelphia Renaissance with the, the artwork. He really helped to um, rejuvenate the neighborhood and everything. Yep. So, Molly says, yes, I went to I Philly for too. school. Love his work. And he's all about mosaics and used um, uh, tiles. Mirrors is a big thing. He likes to reflect the city back into his work. So nice. you're part of the artwork as well. And I remember moving to Philadelphia from a rural area was such a culture shock for me. But the mosaics actually like... you. 
it was nice because I was surrounded by artwork, yeah. you know, so yeah. that was one thing I really loved about it. So I went to Magic Gardens and, you know, I brought my daughter who was three at the time there and we spent a lot of time there and he was expanding. He was like growing even further south towards our area, bought another building. But anyway, I went to his website um, and I was like, I wonder if he sells anything and out of that curiosity, sure enough, he had mosaics for sale. And I was like, oh, oh. So, of course, I, I bought a couple. He was going through his, his pink period, so some of them are a little um, risque. Uh, so I, <laughs> I had to, like, you know, I, I bought four initially. Um, and I had, you know, a little kid in the house and stuff. And then I went to the gallery. I went to Magic Gardens to go pick them up. And I was all inspired. And he had, he just happened to have like a series of mosaics for sale, which I was like, this is so exciting. But some of them were a little too graphic. So I actually turned two of them down, which I'm kind of sorry I did. But I took two others that weren't so much. But I love his work. Um, and he's a fixture. He walks around South Philadelphia. I was telling Todd before we started <laughs> Um, that the preschool I used to take my daughter to, um, his Magic Gardens was right around the corner. So he would pull his car out and I saw him in the car one time and I was like, hi, like he was so famous and he, he lit up and he was smiling back at me and waving and I was like, oh my God. So anyway, I have two of his pieces. I keep my eyes out for more of his yeah. mosaics. He's, he's old. He's much older now. He's about 81 years old. Oh. Um, but you know, he's a part of history and I just feel like, you know, if you, if you see it and you love it, find it. Well, and I think, you know, when you see something like this or when you see something like this, or especially when you see something like this and you realize that it has this, this legendary connection to a place, Yeah. right? That in and of itself, you know, to, to, to have a piece of this in your home, mm -hmm. I think is, is is really special yeah right and, and, and it also connects you back to your time there mm -hmm. you know much more than any kind of i don't know mass-produced object is going to do because this th these works i love the way these works sort of you know the, the tradition of mosaic number one is one of usually either pattern or picture yeah it's a it's very and when they cut the stone um there's some even organization with the way that they cut it. Um, you know, they're like rectangles or squares or right. circles. Like there's identifiable geometric forms. He does not do that. Like there's a couple of squares and stuff here and there, but he really just, um, he just goes for it. Well, there's like a real kind of sense of, you know, we, th we think about how you organize things with mosaic and his is this sort of organized chaos, mm -hmm. right? And I think it's where this magic, I love that he used the word magic yep. because he kind of takes that space and really transforms it in a real sort of, um, uh, it's a wonderland. It is. Right? Well, his grout too, he colors the grout. Yeah, I see. I can see that yep. actually and in some of those areas. And that's part of the wonder in it too. And he'll use old plates. He'll use glass he'll use mirrors and then he takes clay and then he draws into the clay sometimes then he fires it and then he puts that in there so in you know er everywhere you look like every couple of blocks you're going to come across something of his in the city so and I, what i love about this story though is that you loved this work you had a direct connection to it. I went out and I found and it. And you went out and found it. Yeah. I think that's what's really important here. And so, you know, this is something I think we can all sort of take away from this is that you need to know where to look, right? And in this case, you didn't even have to know where to look. It was around you, mm -hmm. right? Now, we might not all have the luxury of having public art directly in our face all the time. This is true. Right? Yeah. But this, I think, is a really, really great example because... You know, we've got somebody that is world renowned, like Shepard Ferry, that we're talking about tonight, and we've got someone who is very locally renowned. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think that this is a fantastic way to go. Mm -hmm. Plus, there's a physicality to this, mm -hmm. a tactility to this, mm -hmm. that I really think is fabulous. Like I would, I, I love actually seeing those, yeah. and you know, feeling them and I'm feeling thinking. them. You, yeah. you can't feel a Shepard Ferry printer. You're going to get your fingerprints on that, it. That's true. That's true. But I'm, you know, and I'm always on the lookout, like if he has anything else, because he goes through periods where that's what he does. And artists do that. Right. Um, artists go through periods where they're, they're creating new work. And sometimes it can be something, um, you know, like these were more ideas for larger works. Right. 
and sometimes you can get them that way and they're you know the mosaics to me were affordable yeah. i mean and they might increase in value they might not yeah but, um yeah that's well what we want to do is we want to kind of give you a homework assignment if you're going to be if you're interested in this idea of collecting if you're interested in this idea of coming along with us on this format of this show every once in a while we're going to give you a homework assignment for the next show and the next show should be if we do this right four weeks away but really coming dangerously close to the heavy holiday season. Or even like six weeks. And It'll probably be closer to six weeks. Yeah. But what we want to do is we want to give our viewers a homework assignment where they go out there and they find something that they really like. They find something either through, you know, like there's the Artsy app, which can be a little bit higher end. There's Instagram, which is a really fantastic resource, right? There's The great thing about Instagram, and that is probably the most accessible um, forum for artwork for where we're at right now. And if you like somebody, the biggest trick with that is to see who they're following and to see who they're liking, mm -hmm. because you start to go down these different rabbit holes and you get exposed to so many other artists mm -hmm. and you get to see who, who they're drawn to, who influences them. And I have spent way too much time <laughs> going down these rabbit holes and usually they link it to like a website like even today before the show I was like going down that route and then there was a sketchbook artist that I fell in love with on Instagram and he's selling work right now and I was like oh you know because it's Christmas time some of these artists are written there's a lot of um you know like artist support pledge and such with artist the pandemic there's a lot of um stuff going on right now in the art world. There's a fantastic show that they do at Art Space, uh, Artist, Artist Space in New York uh, called Night of a Thousand Drawings, which is a fantastic place to get started collecting artwork. Basically, artists from all over the city donate drawings to the gallery for a fundraiser. You walk in, every drawing on the wall is either $30 or $50, and you can't see who made the work because they're all hanging on clotheslines. So you buy it because you like what it looks like and you pay either $30 or $50. And I know people that go in there and they pick out a work that they like and when they buy it and they flip it over, it's like a Kiki Smith or it's like some other like blow the top of your head off cool. artist. It's so freaking cool. Yeah. So I used to donate every year to Night of a Thousand Drawings and one of the editors of Art Forum bought both of my drawings, which was like another thing that just made my head spin. Um, so there are there are really cool ways to go out there and do this. So your homework assignment was going to be to, number one, find somebody, research that person, and investigate buying a piece of their work. Now, if it is just way too out there in terms of the price and it's not something that's for you, move on to another one because this is the process, right? See if there's somebody that's a little bit more accessible, a little bit more accessible. And then pick that piece up. It'd be interesting to talk about where we are starting. I think it's a good conversation to have. Things you have to think about in the future, right? When you start doing this. Number one, storage. Do you have that flat file? Maybe you're going to frame everything and hang it on the walls. I've seen works that you'll pay $125 for the piece of work and $300 for the frame, yeah. which is insane. That is insane. But there's, there's storage issues, right? There's the potential for needing to insure your collection one day. Mm -hmm. We will talk about that. Like I want, as we sort of start to develop these collections, I want to be able to talk about it. Um, there's a whole story I want to tell you about. I started an art buying co-op with seven other people. It was like an investment club. And, you know, it worked. It really worked. So there are all different ways in which you can go about collecting and budgeting. So come up with a budget for yourself. It can be small. And, you know, can you spend $50 one month on a piece of artwork? I think you can. Um, so get out there and do that. And then share with us what you picked up. I would love to sort of start going through that. Or if you're a private person and you really don't want to do that, that's fine too. But come along for the journey. Mm. Right? Yeah. So we looked at two tonight that I think are really collectible. I think Shepherd Fairy is a great investment opportunity, but you got to be fast. Right? And if you don't get one next month, or next week, wait for the next one. Mm -hmm. Wait for the next one. I used to buy one of his every week because I could, right? They were there. And then they started disappearing. He had one big show and a big book came out called Supply and Demand and his show Supply and Demand skyrocketed his fame level a thousand fold 
And now I can, if I get, if I get two a year, I'm lucky. So hang in there, right? Just hang in there and just keep plugging away at it or find someone that nobody is buying. Yeah. Sometimes it's really fun Yeah. to just do that. Yeah. We got a few cool ones to feature for you. We're going to show you some stuff on this segment of our show every month or so that I think are going to, it's going to be a lot of fun. So anyway, I hope this helped you guys. I hope this kind of brought you some information, maybe inspired you to buy some stuff. Um, you know, I, I, I want to tell more stories about the investment side of this that might be able to sort of jazz those of you up that are thinking about it from a money standpoint. I will tell you this. There was once a piece of art I bought for $300 and sold to put the deposit on my first home. That's an inspiring story. I'm not going to tell it now, but get out there and buy something. Yeah. Find find somebody's work and support them. Yeah. All right? Yeah. Tis the season. Tis the season. Mm-hmm. So thanks, Pumpkin Audrey. Thank you. We appreciate that. We yep. need to... Uh, I've got a tiny little bit left for my toast. Ooh. Yes. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving to you. Enjoy, you know, your virtual Thanksgivings as best you can. Um, you know, yeah. I get it. It's weird. It's yeah, weird. That's okay, though. We should stream on Thanksgiving. We should. We can eat Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts and mac and cheese. Mm. There you go. We're not doing the meat thing, so um, uh, yeah. we're going to have a vegetarian Thanksgiving. Yeah. All right, Amanda, thanks for all coming. Right. As Good always, night, thank, you, thank you to all of you for coming. We really appreciate it. And we will see you next Tuesday. And uh, I'm not supposed to say that. Um, and don't forget to join me on Sunday for my drawing show. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Were you going to say that? No. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Have a good Am's night, like, guys. Em's laughing at me. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for coming, Molly. Nice to have you. All right. Take care, everyone. i got to find the button. I can't find the button.